This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. In this episode of the Yonkazine Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Nader Senai. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm Peter Hoffland, and this is the Yonkazine Brief. In this episode of the Ongesim Brief, I asked Dr. Sanai about phase zero studies, also known as microdosing studies, and why they are so important in the development of promising new drugs. And I also asked Dr. Sanai about a potential non-invasive treatment option for glioblastoma and the data he presented during the annual meeting of the European Society for Medical Oncology and the data he will present at the meeting of the European Association for Neuro-Oncology later this week. The Oncozine Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal Oncozine at oncozine.com, where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer, cancer diagnosis and treatment, and cancer prevention. For information on how to support the program, visit our website at oncozine.com. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. This is the Oncozine Brief. For the latest news about cancer and cancer treatment, visit our online journal, Oncozine, at www.oncozine.com. Dr. Sinai, welcome to the Oncozine Brief. Thank you, Peter. Good to be back. It's nice to have you back and talk a little bit about some of the new drug developments and efforts in the treatment of brain cancer, including glioblastoma at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center. But before we talk about some of the results in drug development, let's talk a little bit about glioblastoma. Why is glioblastoma so difficult to treat? So glioblastoma is the most common, what we call primary brain tumor in adults worldwide. Primary brain tumor means that the tumor comes from the brain tissue itself rather than a metastasis, for example, that travels to the brain from other parts of the body. So glioblastoma is unfortunately something that we see uh, not infrequently. It can occur uh, in patients of really any age, any ethnicity, any socioeconomic background, any genetic background. It is not a tumor that Uh, derives from environmental exposures or from lifestyle habits. It is a spontaneous tumor that occurs in patients. And when it occurs, it typically presents with really unmistakable symptoms, oftentimes like very severe headaches that land you in the emergency room, seizures, sudden stroke-like symptoms, like the inability to move your arms or legs or the inability to speak. And um, when these tumors arise, they progress rather aggressively, which is why they're commonly considered to be one of the deadliest, if not the deadliest cancer known to man. And the IV Brain Tumor Center, simply put, was engineered and created specifically to develop new therapies for this type of brain cancer and others. We are a early phase drug development program located at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. We are the highest volume brain tumor center in the United States. And as a consequence of our focused effort, we are also the largest program for early phase clinical trials, meaning clinical trials with new drugs that have been recently developed, new therapies that have been recently developed for brain cancer. When we talk about the development of novel drugs, traditionally, we talk about a clinical trial phase one, phase two, and phase three. That's more or less the standard in clinical development. But you're conducting so-called phase zero trials. I think for a lot of our listeners, this may be something very new in terms of understanding about the kind of trials that you're conducting. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? What are phase zero trials? So as you alluded, there are different phases to clinical trials. And typically, 
the general community thinks of them as phases one, two, and three. A phase one clinical trial, simply put, is a clinical trial where you have a new therapy, for example, a new drug, and you simply want to know, is it safe to take? What is the right dose for this drug where a patient can get it and they won't get sick? And so a phase one trial focuses entirely on just gradually increasing the drug dosing until patients become symptomatic from the drug. So phase one trials are not designed to determine whether a drug is effective or doing anything to the cancer. They're just simply there as a safety check. Once that safety check is done and we know, for example, what drug dose might be safe, then we go on to a phase two trial where that drug dose is used. And in a general way, we look and see whether or not there's any reason to suspect that the drug is effective. A phase two trial will not generally prove that it's effective, but in its best forms, it is really a smoking gun that tells you, okay, this drug looks like it's having some activity, better move on to a phase three, or this drug really does not look very promising, so our enthusiasm for a phase three is lower. And a phase three is where you really determine definitively if the drug is actually helping the patient. And we do that through a process called randomization, where when patients enter the trial, they are randomly assigned to either receive the drug or a placebo. And because of that randomization, you know that if the patients who received the drug did better, that that result is a consequence of the drug and not some other external factor. So the phase one, two, three system is a tried and true bread and butter system for drug development and any other types of scientific inquiry um, conducted in the United States and worldwide. However, after many, many years of this system, it became apparent that number one, we were spending far too much time studying drugs that ultimately were not effective and we were wasting time and resources on that. And number two, that some of the critical questions about a drug's effect weren't being answered because these studies are designed to test safety and they're designed to see if, for example, a patient's tumor stays away for longer or a patient's tumor goes away and never comes back. Those would be the types of what we call endpoints in those trials. But in many cases, a more proximal and perhaps more important question is, what is the drug doing? Is the drug even getting to the tumor? And is the drug, when it does get to the tumor, having its intended biological or molecular effects? Now, with the phase one, two, and three system, you don't get those answers. You make assumptions about them. For example, if the patient lives longer, you can assume that the drug had something to do with that. And if you have enough of those patients, the statistics will give you a higher degree of confidence that the drug was the reason why those patients live longer. But it's not really a direct connection. And for complicated cancers like glioblastoma, we know that there's a lot of variability from patient to patient. And many of us have met patients with glioblastoma that have lived many, many years. And we've met other patients that ultimately passed away within months. And they both had the same tumor. And in many cases, they both had the same treatment, but one of them responded far better than the other. So this kind of variability makes it difficult to draw hard and fast conclusions, especially on smaller scale studies like phase ones and phase twos about whether or not a drug is actually the reason why you're seeing an effect. So the phase zero clinical trial paradigm was originally introduced by the FDA in 2004. And they basically said to all of the investigators and scientists, here's another way we can go about this. Instead of giving the drug to the patient long-term and seeing what happens, why don't we give them a small exposure to the drug before some sort of planned operation or procedure or biopsy. And the idea is that you expose the tumor to a small 
dose of the drug before some surgery or biopsy. And then when you get the tissue from that tumor, you can answer these questions very directly. Number one, did the drug get to the tumor? This seems like a trivial question, except those of us that work in brain cancer know that your brain is designed to keep things out of it. That's how it protects itself. And so therefore, 99% of the drugs that are developed by the pharmaceutical and biotech and biopharma industries, 99% of those drugs don't actually make it into the brain. And therefore, they have no effect on any brain tumors there. So determining whether a drug got to the tumor in sufficient quantity is really the number one priority for any new drug. And then the second question that a phase zero trial will answer, because you have tissue after the drug has been administered to the patient, is whether the drug has hit whatever targets it's supposed to hit. Because these days, the drugs that are developed by the by the industry, by our community of scientists, these are not typically what we call chemotherapy. A chemotherapy is sort of a toxic drug with a nonspecific effect that's designed to really hurt any growing tissue and hopefully hurt a tumor more than it hurts the patient. But more and more today, we're relying on what are called targeted inhibitors and other more tailored therapies. And these therapies, hit specific molecular targets in the tumor. They're like guided missiles. And so a phase or a trial will tell you not only did the guided missile get there, but did it hit its target. And the reason that this phase zero mechanism is so important and very complementary to the phase one, two, and three mechanisms is that it tells you very quickly whether you have a drug on your hands that has the potential to do something good or whether it's really something that we shouldn't be looking at any further. Because if the drug is not getting there, or if it's not hitting its target, then at that point, the logical thing to do is to stop looking at that drug and to either improve it or just look elsewhere. So in a nutshell, that's the concept of the phase zero clinical trial. Let's take a break. If you're just joining us, in this episode of the Ongezin Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Nader Sinai. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Youngest in Brief. Hi, I'm Paul Schmidt, one of the many voices of the Oncazine Brief. Help us by making your message heard in our program and online in Oncazine at www.oncazine.com. To request a media kit and learn more about advertising, sponsorship, and media partnership opportunities, download our media kit at www.oncazine.com slash media kit. This is the Oncazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. This is the Oncosim Brief. If you're just joining us in today's episode of the Oncosim Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Nader Senai. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Bear Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, when you look at traditional clinical trials, a phase one trial, also referred to as first in human studies, often includes a relatively small number of patients diagnosed with a specific disease. And then in subsequent phases, phase two and phase three, the number of patients is growing. Is that the same for phase zero trials? So you're absolutely right. As you go up from phase one, two, and three, the number of patients requires increases exponentially. A phase one trial could be 10 or 20 patients. A phase two trial could be anywhere from 50 to 100. A phase three trial can number in the thousands. And that's difficult. It takes a lot of time and money. Phase zero trials are designed to be small. And the concept behind that is that when you're doing a thousand person trial, you have a thousand patients in part because any little difference is what you wanna detect. If the drug adds two months of survival to a disease that typically has a 16 month survival, for example, you know, that's not a very big difference 
So you need thousands of patients in order to see that difference. In a phase zero trial, the approach is really quite the opposite. You're not looking for some incremental signal. You're looking for high signal to noise. So phase zero trials are typically anywhere from 10 to 15 patients. And if in 10 or 15 patients, you can't determine whether this drug is getting there and hitting its target, then it's probably not, or it's not doing it in sufficient quantities that it's relevant. So it's really an all or nothing type of assay. And in a field like ours in brain cancer, where we have so many failed therapies and failed drugs and failed efforts at drug development, we really need to focus on new therapies that are truly promising, not things that are incrementally promising where maybe over many, many years, we can add five or 10% of survival benefit. We want therapies that really you know, are, are hitting home runs. And so the phase zero trial statistical design is, is predicated on that concept. Now, when we look again at the phase zero trial, is it correct to understand that with the results of such a trial in hand, you can see if a drug may actually have an effect? However, whether the drug has the potential to cure a patient or not may be something that needs to be investigated in subsequent trials, right? But when you're conducting a phase zero trial, is it possible then to skip a phase one trial? Because while there are, they're not entirely overlapping, there is some similarities with a phase one trial. Yes, that's a great question, Peter. So you're, you're absolutely right. A phase zero trial doesn't lengthen the time for drug development, it shortens it. And it does it in a couple different ways. Number one, it will very quickly identify for you what drugs really just do not need to be studied any further. So you're not gonna waste time on drugs that are not promising and not knowing that for many years. Um, so it helps us conserve our resources and focus on the areas of true promise. Number two, you're right in that it does um, supplant some of the um, necessity for a phase one in certain circumstances. So think about what a phase one trial gives us. A phase one trial takes a drug and increases the dose incrementally until you reach a toxicity ceiling. And that's been the paradigm in drug development in cancer for generations. The more drug in a patient, the better. That's been the assumption. And so therefore, we need to just keep giving these patients more drug until they're sick enough that they can't handle it. And one level below that toxicity ceiling is where the drug needs to be dosed. Well, that assumption is predicated on a drug where its effect is proportional to its dose. And that is true for chemotherapies, but that is not true for today's modern therapies. Targeted therapies are predicated on hitting a target at the right place at the right time in the right amount. And oftentimes the right amount is not the maximum amount. It's oftentimes some intermediate amount. So a phase or a trial can be adjusted so it has a dose escalation paradigm within it. This is what we call a phase zero one. And what it does is you're titrating the drug dose to biological effect, what we call the optimal biological dose, which is oftentimes lower than what's called the maximum tolerated dose that the phase one trials arrive at. So in this approach, you're really titrating the drug to what you really wanna see, which is what is the maximum target effect from this drug, not what you don't want to see, which is toxicity. Um, and so our center's approach is very much what you just described. When we have new drugs that have not been through a phase one, we'll combine it into a phase zero one. It'll be a smaller scale study. Our patients will not hit a toxicity ceiling. And at the end of the study, we'll have an optimum dosing regimen for the drug that really means something biologically rather than adhering to an age-old paradigm that probably has less relevance. Right. So you're looking for an initial effect and if something works, rather than how far can you push a potential new drug in terms of toxicity? Exactly right. If you have a drug and it's intending to suppress pathway X, well, all you care about is how well it suppresses pathway X. If I give 
a hundred milligrams of that drug and I get a maximum suppression of pathway X, but I give 200 milligrams and I get less suppression. Well, then why would I go to the higher dose? It's going to have more side effects and less biological effects. And the way these pathways work is that they're, they're like finely tuned instruments. You know, there's a resonance to them. When you inhibit them at the right level, they are inhibited. But if you push them over the edge, it triggers all sorts of other downstream pathways to activate and it can actually neutralize your efforts. So more drug is not always better when it comes to the new generation of uh, designer drugs. Now, just a question that really arises from what you just described about the traditional phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. You refer to a placebo. Now, most people believe that a placebo is something that has no therapeutic effect, a sugar pill or saline injection. But that's not the case in cancer research, right? In a treatment of cancer, including glioblastoma, a placebo refers to the control. And that does not deprive patients who participate in a clinical trial of effective medications. So if an effective therapy exists, an experimental or investigational drug is compared with the best available treatment, often the standard of care, which makes sure that a patient receives the treatment and the investigators, the researchers, get the information on the safety and efficacy of new treatment options, right? That's right. There's different ways to compare drugs. And today, it's very difficult from an ethical standpoint to justify putting patients on a true placebo. In fact, what we want to do, like you said, is compare a new drug to the old drug. And so the old drug will be considered standard of care, and the new drug will be whatever you're trialing. So you're absolutely right. Um, we need to be taking steps above what we're currently achieving today with the standard of care for glioblastoma. For example, the, the median survival is quoted as anywhere from 14 to 18 months, depending on what data set you look at. <clears throat> and that's, that's the benchmark against which we have to compare everything else. Let's take a short break, and then we're back with Dr. Nader Sanai. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Bayer Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. In the 1960s, a coalition of concerned citizens, scientists, and politicians joined forces to convince the federal government to focus its efforts on conquering cancer. In 1971, a single piece of legislation forever changed how we view cancer and cancer treatment. In that year, on December 23, 1971, the National Cancer Act was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. The National War on Cancer was declared, with some leaders naively arguing that the disease would be conquered by the nation's bicentennial, a mere five years in the future. The National Cancer Act cemented the nation's commitment to medical science, clinical trials, and advanced research, and over the next five decades, scientific discoveries demonstrated the great complexity of what had formerly been thought of as a single disease. With the advent of the genetic characterization of cancer, it is now recognized that there are almost an infinite number of cancers as defined by their many genetic mutations. The National Cancer Act established the infrastructure for the designation of centers of excellence by the National Cancer Institute, and these centers have evolved into models of multidisciplinary, collaborative cancer research, treatment, and prevention, contributing to a reduction in cancer mortality and increase in the quality of life and survival that has translated into more than 17 million cancer survivors in the United States since 2021. Join the Yonkazine Brief this spring as we share the stories, the people, past and present, who have made progress possible and have shaped how cancer research, clinical trials, and treatment are being conducted today. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. In today's episode of the Youngest in Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Nader Senai. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Bayer Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. 
And in this episode of the Oncogene Brief, we talk about phase zero studies as well as new options for the treatment of glioblastoma presented at the 2021 annual meeting of the European Society of Medical Oncology and later this week at the meeting of the European Association for Neuro-Oncology. I'm Peter Hofland and this is the Oncogene Brief. Now let's talk a little bit about the trials that you're conducting and the new treatment options you're working on. One of the studies that you're conducting includes a non-invasive solodynamic therapy, or SDT. And this week, during ESMO, the annual meeting of the European Society for Medical Oncology, you've presented some of the data about this treatment option. Can you tell me a little bit more about this therapy, what involved, and the data you've presented? So sonodynamic therapy is an entirely new paradigm that we're very intrigued by. The basic premise of sonodynamic therapy is that you can take energy from non-invasive ultrasound that's administered to a tumor and use that energy to activate a molecule within the tumor. And when you activate it, it leads to the tumor cell's death. So to be specific in this case, what we are trialing at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center is a first in human phase zero one clinical trial on what's called 5-aminolevulinic acid, otherwise known as 5-ALA, sonodynamic therapy. And so the way that this therapy works in theory, and I say in theory because up until this trial, no one had actually done it to know if it actually happens. But in, the theory was that patients could be administered this drug. The, the commercial version of the drug in development is called Sonala001 made by a company called Sonalysense, based in Berkeley, California. And this drug is basically a molecule called 5-aminolevulinic acid, which is a, a drug that we know is safe because it's been used in other contexts for different tumor patients as a way to visualize the tumor. And when the drug is administered to a patient, the tumor metabolizes the drug but it doesn't completely metabolize it because the tumor itself has inherent metabolic abnormalities. So the normal degradation sequence of the drug gets interrupted and you're left with one of the byproducts of that degradation called protoporphyrin 9. And protoporphyrin 9 is an interesting molecule. By itself, it's totally inert and not toxic. If you're in the operating room and you have a tumor that has accumulated protoporphyrin 9, you can shine a blue fluorescent light on the tumor and the protoporphyrin will reflect that blue light wavelength back in the red wavelength channel. So it enables you to see tumor cells and residual tumor in the operating room. And that's how it's used conventionally in the United States and in Europe. But the other features of the molecule that's, that's less commonly known is that if you activate it with enough energy, that light energy activation will actually precipitate a redox reaction, the formation of what are called reactive oxygen species. And these, these molecules that, that generate from this, these singlet oxygen, have a cascade of effects, all of which are deleterious to the tumor and actually toxic to the tumor and will kill the tumor cell. So what sonodynamic therapy does is it capitalizes on this opportunity but instead of using light wavelengths to activate the molecule, it uses ultrasound wavelength. So simply put, patients with a glioblastoma come to us, and on a morning, they will have an IV infusion of this drug. And this drug will then be circulated into the patient's system without any negative effects, but it will lead to the accumulation of protoporphyrin in the patient's glioblastoma. And then several hours later, the patient has a frame placed on his or her head that is attached to their skull. This is done with local anesthetic, so it's painless. There's no general anesthesia for this procedure, and there's no surgery. And then the patient with this frame goes into a specialized MR-guided focused ultrasound unit which is currently an experimental unit generated by a company in Tel Aviv, Israel, called Incitec, who's one of the world leaders in MR-guided ultrasounds. 
And we're able to program this device to target the tumor specifically with ultrasound energy. This energy does not harm the patient by itself. It does not raise the temperature of the tissue. It does not harm the patient's skin or skull. It passes through it safely like ultrasound energy is known to do. But when it converges on that tumor with the protoporphyrin 9, it activates the protoporphyrin 9 and the cascade of events leads to cell death. And what we have recently reported at the European Society of Medical Oncology, and will subsequently report at a number of other meetings upcoming, is our first in human experience with this device, which demonstrates that in fact, very specifically, and without any off-target effects, without any toxicity, this strategy works in glioblastoma tumors. And it does generate the reactive oxygen species in the targeted tissue after that patient has received Sonala 001, and it does generate targeted cell death in that targeted tissue as a consequence of those reactive oxygen species. And most importantly, the areas that we don't target, the areas that we leave as a control tissue in that patient's tumor as a comparator, all remain normal and unaffected. So what we have here potentially is a new modality for treating glioblastoma. Today, there are several existing modalities for treatment that are all part of the standard of care. We have surgery as one modality. We have medical therapy as a second modality. Today, that's the drug Temidar. And we have radiation as a third modality. And we have what are called tumor treating fields which is the uh, electric magnetic cap that some patients wear, that's the fourth modality. Sonodynamic therapy, we believe, is now going to become the fifth modality. And it's different from all these other modalities in that it appears to be exquisitely targeted and exquisitely safe. And so the questions remain for us to answer and for our field to answer, how far can we take this? This is a device and strategy where conceivably you could administer it multiple times over the course of a patient's treatment without any of the potentially unwanted side effects that you sometimes see from radiotherapy, for example, without the risks of surgery, without the systemic side effects of chemotherapy. Um, so uh, we're very intrigued. Uh, we think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. and. Um, you know, the, the, the hypothesis for how this therapy would work was tantalizing, but very, very difficult to demonstrate uh, in the laboratory. This is why the answer could only be arrived at through a phase zero clinical trial in patients. And we're, we're proud to have partnered with InsightTech and Synalysense to get this done for the first time worldwide. Let's take a break. If you're just joining us, in this episode of the Ongezin Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Nader Senai. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongezin Brief. Clinical trials allow researchers to introduce new hope by providing participants access to cutting-edge and potentially life-saving treatments. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. This is the Oncosim Brief. If you're just joining us, in today's episode of the Oncosim Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Nader Senai. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Bear Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. This study and the potential treatment requires further development, but if successful, it means a major change in the way glioblastoma and other brain tumors are actually treated, correct? I think so. You know, a lot remains to be determined. We need to understand how far we can push this therapy, how much cell death can we elicit. You know, our most recent results 
indicate that we're seeing biological effect, not just in what's called the contrast enhancing tumor, which is the part of the tumor that lights up with IV contrast in the MRI. That's actually the easier part of the tumor to control. It's the non-enhancing tumor, the area outside of that, that's really so lethal and untreatable. And that's where we're also seeing biological effects. So you're absolutely right, Peter. The question now is, how do you smartly deploy this? Because the, the non-toxicity of it, the non-invasive nature of it, really lends itself to a multiple treatment paradigm where you could envision patients coming in even weekly to get another round of treatment without really even requiring any anesthesia um, and just constantly pushing against this tumor. The other part of it that's so, I think, promising is that, you know, this is not a strategy that is predicated on a certain genetic predisposition of the tumor. This is not a targeted inhibitor, for example, that only works in a subset of a certain genetic background tumor. This is uh, you know, something that exploits a core metabolic vulnerability in, as far as we know, all glioblastomas. Um, so the, the, the applicability of it is also quite striking. That sounds very interesting. But there are also other investigational therapies that are being tested in your center. Some of the results will be presented at the meeting of the European Association for Neuro-Oncology later this week. Tell me a little bit more, in a nutshell, what are some of the novel treatments that you are presenting at this meeting? Right. So as you know, at the Ivy Center, we're very agnostic to what we are trialing. We are not beholden to any one school of thought with respect to how to target brain cancer and glioblastoma. So we cast a wide net and anything that looks promising, if the data holds up, we're going to put it to the test in a phase zero trial. And um, as we've evolved this strategy, we've really gone towards drug cocktail approaches because I think everyone in our field is fairly confident that a single drug therapy will not be effective for such a complicated disease. Unfortunately, dual drug trials are few and far between, and we intend to change that. So, uh, for example, at the most recent European Society of Medical Oncology in, in 2021, we reported a new phase zero two clinical trial of two different targeted inhibitors combined together, what's called a CDK4-6 inhibitor which is a cell cycle inhibitor combined with an ERK-1-2 inhibitor. These are two drugs that were developed by Eli Lilly. The CDK4-6 inhibitor is called abemaciclib, and it was originally developed for breast cancer not too many years ago, and it is one of the a new class of that agent. The ERK-1-2 inhibitor is at what's called a first-in-class agent. So this is a, uh, a, a really novel molecule that's targeting this target, and we think these targets are complementary based on our prior trials. So we've reported these results in our interim analyses. What's very fascinating is that both of these drugs, uh, unlike many others, really do have the capacity to get into the tumor and even into the difficult parts of the tumor to access with a high degree of efficiency. So that is very promising because it tells us that these are reagents that can be used for this strategy and for other cocktails in the future. And we also see some biological evidence of them hitting their targets as well. What remains to be seen is whether this translates into a clinical result. We're, we've reported the interim analysis with our first 21 patients, but we need several more, I think, in order to reach a conclusion as to whether this cocktail is going to be a durable solution for patients. But this is how we plan on arriving at viable solutions for our patients and for the world community. We have to quickly trial different combination drug cocktails and, 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 and concepts and, and figure out what reagents, what elements are working, what are not, how can we recombine them, how can we exploit vulnerabilities that we weren't aware of, and how can we take care of resistance mechanisms that come to bear. So it's really an important strategy. This is one of the first, if not the first, dual drug phase zero two trial attempted in, in brain cancer patients and we're happy to continue with that sort of effort. One of the things you've mentioned is that this particular drug that you're studying in glioblastoma 
and there may be more drugs like this, this particular drug was developed for the treatment of patients diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, how does this treatment translate to a possible option for the treatment of patients diagnosed with glioblastoma? Because it seems to me that there is a major difference between the treatment of breast cancer and the treatment of glioblastoma. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, as you know, at the core of many cancers are the same culprits and mechanisms. Um, and as you also know, the world's attention and the industry's attention on drug development is focused on markets that are large, with many patients affected by the disease, and with the possibility for high return on investment. So naturally, a cancer like breast cancer, for example, will uh, receive the deserving attention of the biopharma industry. And there, are, there have been incredible advances, for example, in breast cancer management because of those efforts. So we know that in this industry, when it puts its mind to something, good things happen. And you can see that with the improving survival rates in breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, all of these have been benefactors of effective drug development. Now we can't expect the industry to apply the same level of resources to the brain cancer community as deserving as they are simply because the market size is not what these other cancers are. But what it does offer us an opportunity to do is to borrow the same concepts. And when we see mechanisms exploited in other cancers that are relevant to brain cancer, we can then pivot and convince those companies to share with us those reagents, those molecules, and trial them in this space. And that's what the Ivy Brain Tumor Center is so effective at, is unlocking the coffers of these companies and their many, many promising young drugs and getting them to allow us to trial them. And we approach them very simply with an offer that I think for many of them is difficult to refuse. We tell them, look, we have the expertise, we have the patient volume, we have the infrastructure to do a quick, efficient, and informative phase zero clinical trial with your drug or drugs in this patient population. We will take all the risk, we will pay for the study, we will design it, we will get the regulatory approval, and at the end of this, we will turn the data over to you, we will give you all of the intellectual property from our efforts, as long as you enable us to publish the data unfiltered. And when companies are approached this way, they very quickly pivot to allow us to use their drugs. All right, that's very interesting. So if I understand this correctly, you look for drugs with a specific mechanism of action, a drug designed to reach a specific target, which may be found in the kind of cancer for which a drug was initially approved, as well as in glioblastoma or other brain tumors. And with the clinical trials that you and your team are conducting at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center, you're trying to find out if these drugs show potential effect in glioblastoma and reaches the intended target and may actually work. That's exactly right. Sometimes there are drugs developed for targets in other cancers that never panned out for that cancer, but it's still relevant to glioblastoma. So we'll be using drugs that perhaps um, rarely have been trialed in patients. And other times there's drugs like abemaciclib that are FDA approved for breast cancer, but still may have some applicability for brain cancer and we'll use it then. So we're very flexible in that regard. Well, that's very good news for patients. Now, changing gears for a moment. Earlier this year, in August, the Ivy Brain Tumor Center started a new construction project. That's right. Well, you know, the Ivy Brain Tumor Center was initially developed in 2018. And since then, we've already screened thousands of patients for our clinical trials. We've opened up a dozen plus clinical trials and rapidly gone through many, many new drugs. So it's become clear to us that this formula works. Our patients are driving the benefit from them. <clears throat> our industry partners are as well. And we've learned an incredible amount in, in less than three years. So as a consequence, it's become very evident that we need to accelerate our efforts and scale up. And one step towards that is generating a new home for the Ivy Center, one that's dedicated entirely to this approach to early phase drug development. So in August, we announced the 
uh, plans for a new Ivy Center headquarters that will be stationed here in Phoenix, Arizona, on the campus of the Barron Neurological Institute. And this will be a 75,000 square foot center dedicated entirely to the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and all of its internal efforts. This will be a home for brain cancer patients worldwide. This will be where the newest drugs will be trialed and developed, um, leading the field. And this will be a unified structure, five floors tall, a combination of clinical space as well as a lot of laboratory space, wet and dry lab that will entirely be focused and brought to bear on this singular problem of brain cancer. So we're very optimistic. We think that this will enable us to double, if not triple our capacity for early phase drug development and really go into spaces of drug development that up until now, we've only been able to participate in at a cursory level, such as drug discovery, but now we can engage fully. When will this new center be finished? What is your timeline for this project? Yeah, we'll be moving into this building in January, 2023. So uh, we've been very lucky to have incredible institutional partners in developing this building, including the Dignity Health uh, Campus and, and, and National Hospital Network, as well as the foundation of the Barrow Neurological Institute. And so everyone has been laser focused on really cutting the time for developing this building. So it will be going up really in, in a matter of months, not years. And um, we're very grateful that uh, as much red tape as possible has been brought down by the city and state in order to enable us to do this. And uh, as a result, within a few short months, we'll, we'll be there and we'll be looking for um, new, new options and avenues of hope for our patients there. Dr. Nadersen Nye, the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Peter. Always a pleasure to talk to you and to be on your podcast. Thank you so much. In this episode of the Onkis in Brief, I spoke with Dr. Nadersen Nye. Dr. Senai is the director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the director of neurosurgical oncology at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. In this episode, we spoke about phase zero studies, also known as microdosing studies, which are designed to speed up the development of promising drugs by establishing very early on whether the drug or agent behaves in human subjects as was expected from preclinical studies. In other words, show some effect in reaching their intended target. We also spoke about a potential non-invasive treatment option for the treatment of glioblastoma and other approaches presented by Dr. Senai during the annual meeting of the European Society for Medical Oncology and the results that will be presented at the meeting of the European Association for Neuro-Oncology later this week. For more information about the IV Brain Tumor Center, visit the organization's website at ivbraintumorcenter.org. For us here at the Youngest in Brave, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors, and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Your support makes it possible that you can hear this program via PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And you can also download our program via podcast and streaming media, including iTunes and Spotify. For more information about supporting the Oncosine Brief, go to Oncosine at Oncosine.com. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and we will make sure that you will receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is a global medical educational service from the publishers of Oncazine and ADC Review, the journal of antibody drug conjugates. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from our commercial underwriters and advertisers and the listeners to this station. For more information about advertising, underwriting, and sponsoring options, visit Oncazine at www.oncazine.com forward slash podcasts.
The Yakuzine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content in this program is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice and guidance. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.